Nomi Klein, climate colonialist. Wrong on Egypt, wrong advice on COP27, and wrong on climate. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society, and today I'd like to talk with you about a recent webinar that I saw with Nomi Klein and a couple of her colleagues in the climate community. Um, and it raised some very serious concerns for me. I'll go through this presentation and show you why. And I think also it's important for people in the West to understand that Egypt is a different country and not try to impose either their climate or other colonial views on Egypt, despite the fact there may be things there that you disagree with. But let me show you what I mean as we go through the presentation. It's probably about a half an hour. Uh, so you might want to get uh, tea or coffee or something and then um, sit back and see what I have to say. So colonialism is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. And it's also a practice of domination, which involves the subjugation of one people to another. So today I call that climate colonialism or eco-colonialism. Now Nomi Klein hosted this webinar with several of her colleagues, one being uh, Bill McKibben. Um, and uh, she was talking about from blah, blah, blah to blood, blood, blood. and. This is about an article that she wrote, my deep dive into why holding the COP27 climate summit in Egypt's police state crosses a dangerous new line. So Nomi Klein and Bill McGibbon tie it all together by saying political freedom, human rights, and climate change, they are all one and the same. I would say I don't really dis I don't really agree with that, um, and I'll show you why. And they're particularly talking about this young man in the webinar. And I think it's important to really understand the background issues of someone like this um, and the context of the world that he's been um, activist in, and why and what's happened to him. The context is very important, as sad as it is for, of course, his loved ones. Um, and apparently he is in dire straits at the moment. He's been on a hunger strike. So Nomi Klein was talking about this article that she wrote for The Intercept. And she believes that this creates a moral crisis for the climate movement. Uh, because there are about 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt, apparently and this mostly relates to um, activism during the Arab Spring, but we're going to learn more about that later too. So I have a caution for the climate kids. Klein and McKibben have influential friends in the USA, but in Egypt you're at risk if protesting. So um, Bill McKibben in the webinar said that it's a great sin to waste leverage when you have it, referring to the bevy of international journalists who will be hanging around the COP27 conference pavilion with not much to do. But that's easy for him to say, though both he and Nomi Klein have been arrested for their climate action protests in the US. They have many friends in high places, according to this report by the US Senate minority staff, entitled How a Club of Billionaires and their foundations control the environmental movement and Obama's EPA. So what I'm saying <clears throat> is that these two are in a country where they know the law, they have lawyers, they have access to people with money and influence, and really this is kind of street theater for climate. So these are not human rights um, issues that they're protesting. And you'll notice they're not in jail, and uh, so that's quite different than the context in Egypt. And it's important to understand that green billionaires are the new climate colonialists. And this article by Matthew Nisbet, which is peer-reviewed, talks about strategic philanthropy in the post-cap-and-trade years. And he talks about this group of about 13 to 15 green billionaires who have been funding environmental groups 
for almost a decade now, over a decade, pushing their pet um, uh, climate initiatives like uh, climate change related communication, media and mobilization, renewable energy, natural gas, this is where they're damning natural gas, they hate it, fossil fuel industry related, this is where they're condemning fossil fuels, um, promoting action to limit fossil fuels, promoting renewable energy, um, promoting and evaluating other low carbon energy technologies, promoting climate mitigation, promoting sustainable agriculture, land use, protect ecosystems, and promoting EVs and clean transportation, clean vehicles. So you can see that these guys have been pumping millions, by now billions of dollars, into this messaging. Uh, and it's because they have vested interests in all the things they're promoting. And um, fossil fuels, of course, uh, are an uh, energy dense source of power for, for people. So uh, wind and solar are not. Now, let's just go to Egypt for a minute and some of the laws there. So even though Nomi Klein and Bill McGibbon are very high profile people, my suggestion is that when the climate strike kids arrive in Egypt, don't be climate colonialists. Respect the law. So in my opinion, and based on what I read on Canada's travel advisory website for Canadians, one should follow the law when visiting Egypt. And the Egypt travel advice is very similar to that of the U.S. State Department. So first of all, it's simply a matter of respect when you're a guest in another country. And secondly, it's the law. And thirdly, um, this uh, a professor of law explains that the Egyptian legal system is built on a combination of Islamic Sharia law and Napoleonic code and uh, some sub subsequent education and training of Egyptian jurists in France. So that means the legal system is very different than in the UK, USA or Canada. So thus protesters might be treated quite differently from protests in Canada or the US. And in my opinion, it would be a shame for innocent young people who are interested in the climate change debate to end up in jail in a foreign country if they start protests at COP27 on human rights or other issues on the advice of Nomi Klein and Bill McGibbon, neither of whom will pay the price for this reckless incitement. And with regard to Egyptian policies, even certain types of social media posts might get you in trouble. So, uh, you know, I think you should respect the law when you're there and, um, and be polite. So here are the commentaries from the U.S. State Department and Travel Canada. And they both say that local law prohibits protests without a permit. They both advise not being anywhere near anti-government protests because you might be uh, seen to be part of it or provoking it in some way. And the US and Canada both say they have limited ability to help you if you get in trouble there. And also Travel Canada says that uh, social media, publishing or posting social media or other content that could be perceived as critical of Egyptian society uh, may be considered illegal under Egyptian law and convictions can carry heavy fines and lengthy prison sentences. There is a high risk of arrest in connection to social media posts considered critical of Egypt. So that's very important knowledge. I recommend that you read up well on this, these issues before you go. And as I say, I respect the fact that you're in a different country. <clears throat> now let's go back to the Arab Spring, which is what uh, Nomi Klein was originally talking about. Um, so most people in the West think the Arab Spring was primarily about pro-democracy. But was it pro-democracy or were these protests about the cost of living and unemployment? Or some of both? Let's have a look. First of all, this is Egypt is part of the MENA region, the Middle East North Africa region, which you can see here in the blue. And it's important to understand in 2006, the World Bank issued a report forecasting that by 2020, 
100 million young Arabs would come of age across the Middle East North Africa region, but there would not be any jobs for them. Now Egypt's population is 102.3 million as of 2020 and most of the people live along the um, Nile River. Uh, so much of the country is desertified, of course, the famous pyramids, uh, but it's not arable land and so people can't really live there. So uh, just to put a little context here geographically, if we overlay the map of Egypt on the US, on Canada, and on Europe, you can see that having 102 million people mostly situated along uh, one area of the country would present a very different challenge than, say, in the US. Just imagine if everybody had to live only along the Mississippi River in the US, or only around the Great Lakes in Canada, or only around particular rivers in Europe. You know, it would change the dynamic of the country, the economic opportunities, and it would simply be a fact of life there. Um, and if we look at the MENA region, you can see exactly where Egypt is, right here. And uh, also Egypt uh, manages the Suez Canal, which is a very important waterway allowing goods and services to be shipped from South Asia right through to Europe or to uh, North America in much less time than had those ships had to go around the bottom of the uh, um, African continent and then up the coast. So Egypt is a very important partner for all nations of the world in terms of trade. And sadly, the Arab Spring of 2011, when many people were arrested, when the government was overturned and then subsequently overturned again, the Arab Spring was driven by U.S. food to fuel climate policies. This is the moral crisis. And this is the finding of NEXI, the New England Complex Systems Institute. Now, NEXI had been tracking the food price index and civil unrest. And, you know, in many of these countries, people live on just a couple of dollars a day. So if the price of food goes up even a little bit, it's very difficult for people to survive. And if it goes up a lot, then it does cause civil unrest. And so they've been tracking this phenomenon uh, for some time, and they have very advanced uh, computer analytics there. And they actually were even reporting to the U.S. State Department that they anticipated that there would be uh, significant civil unrest in Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, etc. Um, when this uh, time peaked. And as you can see, it's due to a huge spike in food prices. So as I mentioned earlier, there's also a very high youth unemployment issue in the MENA region. And unfortunately, a job is not just a job, especially in a part of the world where culture is more traditional. So as noted in this report, um, by the World Bank, a job has always meant more than a salary. As a basic form of social engagement, it can be a critical source of self-fulfillment and self-worth. By that same token, unemployment and underemployment can have significant psychological as well as economic impact. They can be a source of deep frustration and humiliation. The Arab Spring and its call for jobs and dignity made this connection explicit. And so young people in particular took to the streets out of frustration with the lack of opportunities to put their skills and talents to productive use. Now Hernando de Soto has done a number of studies all around the world through his uh, foundation. He's a Peruvian econo economist. And one of the things he found in this book is that property rights, legal title, banking and equity finance are key to a free middle class. 
and DeSoto's team also did a report for the Egyptian government in 2004. So, of course, that's a completely different government than one in power today. And he wrote this article for the Wall Street Journal in uh, 2011, just as all these uprisings were happening. And so he found this. Egypt's underground economy was the nation's biggest employer. The legal private sector employed 6.8 million people, the public sector 5.9 million people, while 9.6 million people worked in the extra legal sector. And as far as real estate is concerned, 92% of Egyptians hold their property without normal legal title. Then he evaluates the the value of this, what he calls dead capital or dead money, because it can't be exploited further. And according to Hernando de Soto's research at the time, these are the barriers for entrepreneurs. Uh, and this again was from Egypt at that time, I don't know how it is today. Uh, to open a small bakery, our investigators found would take more than 500 days. To get legal title to a vacant piece of land would take more than 10 years. An aspiring poor entrepreneur would have to deal with 56 government agencies and repetitive government inspections. So again, that's those were his findings at the time. I don't know how that situation is today. Um, but when you think of, say, Alberta, where I live, if you want to open a small business, you can just file a sole proprietorship with the Alberta government and there you go. You can start your dog walking business tomorrow. Uh, if you want to expand that business and make it into a limited company where uh, you have different kinds of access to banking and um, finance opportunities, you can buy a shell company off the shelf from a lawyer for I don't know, about $400, probably within a week or two, you can have your limited company up and running. Um, and uh, you can bring in partners, you know, and uh, at some point you can start selling shares in corporations. You might have friends and family who want to invest in your idea, or you might take it a step further and get a legal document put together where you can go to the market and raise money. My point being that for most uh, entrepreneurs in Canada, it's pretty easy to start a business overnight. And even some of the simplest ideas, like let's say starting a dog walking enterprise here because people love dogs, you know, you might start it by yourself, then your friend loses their job and they say, wow, I love dogs too. And you go, okay, I can expand my business. The two of you start walking them. There's more demand. So you incorporate, you bring on extra staff, Maybe you buy a building, one of you owns a property, then you go to the bank because you have legal title. So you can go to the bank and say, I own this house or I have equity in this house and I need a loan to buy or rent this building where we're going to set up our, our dog business, whatever it may be, or our bakery or um, you know our bike business. Whatever kind of business you want to set up, it's fairly easy to do it here. And in Canada, small business is about... 94% of the job creation. Again, because it's so nimble and quick. And due to different traditions and different laws there, apparently that's not the same. So you can understand that many young people coming of age who might have a great idea, uh, might have a great difficulty there in trying to get a business off the ground, especially if it's going to be legal. So uh, De Soto talks here about this extra legal uh, sector of the uh, economy and so that means you know people working informally like say working with family or opening their own sort of neighborhood bistro in their house or whatever it may be where they're not really part of the mainstream economy so we have to realize that energy drives life expectancy and it also drives industry and industry drives jobs. And you can see in this graph how the um, OECD countries have really taken off and this is because of the implementation of coal, um, oil, 
natural gas, nuclear, and before it, it was all wood burning, right? So all these different kinds of energies, modern energies, fossil fuel energies, have come on stream together. So some are more predominant than others now, but they're all in the market together. Um, and yet, here's Africa. The huge continent of Africa is lagging because the world wants to force African nations into only using renewables under loan and climate terms set by the West. So that's why I call them climate colonialism. Now, uh, Samuel Ferfari is a professor emeritus in uh, Brussels, and he's uh, written The Urgency to Electrify Africa for a True Sustainable Development. And it's his view that the West should do everything possible to provide grid-scale electricity to the African nations so that they can have jobs and they can have uh, proper sanitation and uh, water being pumped to houses instead of people having to carry buckets. Um, uh, you know, some of these things are not necessarily in Egypt, but in the rest of the continent certainly people are living very much a subsistence survival existence in many places. And Fafari has written a number of books, The Changing World of Energy and Geopolitics, I really recommend that people read this two-volume uh, series. It's very eye-opening. He's written this book, Ecology, Ecology is an Assault on the Western Society. That's basically what it translates to. And Man, uh, God, Man, and Nature. Um, not all these books are in translation in English, but they're great works. And I think that he's quite right. We should be helping the continent of Africa attain proper grid-scale electrification. So now we look at the moral failure of climate policies. So the Nexi research, I'm bouncing back to that, the riots and revolutions of the Arab Spring were the result of two policy decisions made in the United States. Ethanol regulation, which converts food into fuel, is single-handedly responsible for doubling global food prices. Now that was back in uh, this period of time, 2010 to 2012. And then also deregulation of the commodity markets led to dramatic spikes in food prices. So the Arab Spring occurred at the pinnacle of the second, second peak. And Nexi said, we sent a warning to the U.S. government four days before the first events of the Arab Spring began in Tunisia because they could see it was trending, they could see what was happening. Um, so how sad is that, that all the virtue signaling climate activists in the West are actually um, responsible for this moral failure that plunged whole countries into poverty. And climate activists might say, oh, but, you know, we're saving the planet with ethanol. Well, actually, uh, Jean Ziegler, who was the uh, UN rapporteur, rapporteur on um, food, uh, said that burning food crops to produce biofuels is a crime against humanity. And Nexi also found, when they looked at it, that the ethanol conversion... Um, is actually almost negative in terms of energy production. The amount of fossil fuel energy needed to grow the corn and convert it to ethanol is about three quarters of the ethanol energy yield. So uh, what are we doing? We're plunging half the world into food poverty uh, and chaos and claiming that we're saving the planet when we're not doing either. So at that time, climate policies created the real moral crisis, causing famine, civil unrest, and the refugee crisis, and it's happening again today. So here are the recent wheat prices. You can see they have once again spiked dramatically, and now we have a food, fuel, fertilizer, famine crisis. These are the outcomes of the energy crisis, which has been created by Western climate colonialist policies. And unfortunately, natural gas is the new coal to climate activists. And here we have a tweet from Greta. 
The European Parliament just voted to label fossil gas as green energy. This will delay a desperately needed real sustainable transition and deepen our dependency on Russian fuels. Of course, this was before, uh, or no, actually it was after the invasion. Um, the hypocrisy is striking, but unfortunately not surprising. This is still not my taxonomy. Well, I think Greta should probably read those books by Professor uh, Samuel Fafari first before making any more comments on geopolitics and energy uh, because she's clearly misinformed. She might be quite the activist. She has a very large group of people behind her, the we don't have time business community, the carbon trading community, but um, she herself appears to be uh, significantly misinformed about energy and geopolitics because uh, first of all all wind and solar products are made from oil gas and coal wasteful quantities of them and all wind and solar is backed up by natural gas as the reliable supplier when wind and solar drop off so uh, Greta and her followers are actually also climate colonialists plunging the world into heat or eat poverty. Meanwhile, Egypt is keeping the lights on and people warm around the world thanks to natural gas. So Egypt is the third largest natural gas producer in Africa following Algeria and Nigeria. And Egypt operates the Suez Canal and the Suez Mediterranean Pipeline. So this goes on to explain a bit more about how Egypt is uh, actually powering the world, especially in that region. And ironically, during the Klein presentation, one of Nomi Klein's guests even mocked President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi for keeping the lights on to avoid civil unrest. Is Klein's colleague unaware of what is happening in Europe? a winter of blackouts, heat or eat poverty, and decimation of small and medium-sized and even major industry, no one should take advice from climate colonialists. And you can see here in Germany they're preparing for power outages that are longer than 72 hours, longer than three days. They're preparing for energy cost price rises that will force thousands of corner shops to close and there's all kinds of um, protests and rioting going on across the UK as energy crisis and inflation drives UK workers to industrial action and the same in um, France because there's nothing funny about blackouts so actually Egypt is doing a very important thing by keeping their people supplied with reliable power and the rest of the world. So Egypt is an important supplier of natural gas and these are from the USEIA, the Energy Information Administration, which is a very reliable source of energy info. They've been tracking world markets for decades so uh, you can look at that. Uh, you can also cross-check it with the IEA, the International Energy Agency, and also with other reports like the BP statistical report. So you can see that Egypt's LNG exports by destinations, some go to Kuwait, uh, quite a bit goes to Europe. So I would say that supply at this point is critical for Europe because the supplies from Russia have been cut off. They were cut off in part due to the conflict uh, in the Ukraine and subsequently cut off by the Nord Stream pipeline um, explosions. So, um, you know, climate activists should just forget about going to protest natural gas in um, Egypt because if they're doing that, they are really um, condemning people in Europe to an even worse winter. And then you can see that uh, Egypt is also a big exporter to the rest of the world as well. And these are critical supplies. But in Egypt and, and in the Klein webinar, you know, they were advocating that 
Um, Egypt should not be using coal. I believe it only uses coal for industrial applications and it's imported from the US. Um, and they claim that they should be going to renewables. Well, first of all, let's look at what kind of electrical capacity there is in Egypt. Again, from the US EIA. You can see here that Egypt runs on fossil fuels. They, despite the massive Aswan Dam, um, hydroelectricity is an important but it's relatively nominal part of uh, their electrical capacity. Solar, wind, and biomass and waste, it's almost nothing. So you're not going to change that overnight. That will not be changed by 2030 or by 2050. And that's okay because there's no climate catastrophe imminent. I'll show you that later. And you can see the actual generation, again, it's fossil fuels and wind and solar seem to be even poorer performers in terms of actual generation. But what's happened is that Western nations have um, come in and uh, financed uh, large-scale wind farms uh, the size of 1.2 gigawatts and they have plans to develop additional ones but what they're doing is the government awards a contract to Vestas Wind Systems and Hitachi is going to build the infrastructure and uh, when we look down here we find that the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development has provided additional financing for more solar plants so it sounds like they're getting these countries to build facilities that actually create business back in Europe but don't necessarily create business or electrical generation in Egypt. And they're probably doing it through the COP21 agreements and various international climate finance pressures. Now you may say, well, all the countries got on board for the Paris Agreement, COP21, but in fact, most of the developing nations were drawn on board because of global bribery. The West promised these developing nations access to the Green Climate Fund, a hundred billion dollar a year fund, um, which people were supposed to be able to access with no accountability. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> so where's that hundred billion coming from? Well, that's supposed to come from you and I, and that's supposed to be a hundred billion dollars a year from you and I to developing nations. Um, and when I say you and I, I mean the Western nations. Uh, but still, that's a lot of money, and they, it's never been met. They've never actually pulled together that much money, not per year, but at all. So uh, there have been various forms of aid that have been offered. We've got a couple of Robert Lyman pieces on our blog that explain more on that. But um, really, this was a bribe to get people on board, and they've never... The, the proponents of the Paris Agreement and the Green Climate Fund have never ever gotten that money together for the developing nations. So no wonder they're pretty mad because they agreed to certain terms under Paris and started doing things like building wind and solar farms only to find out that, hey, we're not going to stand up to our agreement. And if you want to read sort of the origins of this, this is a report that Robert Lyman did uh, back in uh, 2015, just in time for the Paris Agreement, and that will give you kind of the roots of the story. And now we're at COP27, so you'd think that emissions would have been reduced by now, but nope. <laughs> As pointed out by Roger Pielke Jr. in the era of climate diplomacy, global fossil fuel consumption has risen are increased by 57 percent and uh, those of you who believe that by 2030 or 2050 we could um, get to net zero that's totally ridiculous and you can read here how much uh, conventional energy would have to be replaced by nuclear wind and solar which that's an impossible quest but the good news is the climate emergency is over because it actually stems from the misuse of RCP 8.5 and RCP 6. 
So RCP 8.5 is this very high-end scenario uh, which RCP relates to representative concentration pathway or the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and its assumed impact on warming. So this is an implausible scenario. This is an implausible scenario. But both of these are widely cited in all the reports that the UN IPC, IPCC pumps out. And likewise, bankers are using similar scenarios, misusing them. And Roger PLK Jr. says, scenarios used in climate stress testing by central banks around the world are wildly implausible and of questionable practical utility. So, you see, even if we just get rid of the RCP 8.5, you can see that there is no climate emergency. And in fact, though this is situated at about 2017, in fact, we are more or less on the RCP 4.5 track um, in terms of climate policies and in terms of emissions. And so there's no emergency. The emergency is over. So we can have rational debates now. We do have time. And we don't have to be scared. And the other thing is that over the past 40 years, scientists have continually assessed what's called the um, uh, climate sensitivity of carbon dioxide, meaning the warming effect that it has. And over this time, scientists have found that it's not that much of a warming influence, meaning that you could have more carbon dioxide, but it actually would not have more of a warming effect. So uh, CO2 is not the control knob that can fine-tune climate. And that's a finding of Judith Curry and many others. So what's important is that we focus on adaptation. Many developing nations need adaptive technologies. And, um, you know, we seem to have forgotten in the West what wonderful climate adaptations we've implemented over the past hundred years. We implemented public sanitation, uh, public roadways that are paved and public roads that are lit at night. We've implemented grid-scale electricity. We've electrified virtually all of the rural areas in big countries like Canada and the US and of course all across uh, Europe. Um, these were tremendous efforts on the parts of government and industry. They worked together and they brought useful practical services to the people. The people paid for it through their taxes. Now we have the reverse situation where government policies are crushing useful initiatives and promoting useless ones. Like giving everyone an electric vehicle will actually collapse the power grid and will cost trillions of dollars to implement. And yet it won't be useful. We already have a useful infrastructure. So, uh, you know, things that are adaptive technologies in our housing. We have excellent insulation. So now most houses in Canada can withstand very cold temperatures. We have distributed natural gas to most houses. Um, and these kinds of things uh, we do take for granted entirely. And then we say, oh, let's put up a wind farm to, you know, <laughs> adapt to climate change. No, what we need to do at things like the COP conferences, is to help developing nations with adaptive technologies such as giving them grid-scale electricity like we have in the West. Whether it's coal-fired, natural gas-fired, biomass-fired, doesn't matter as long as they have consistent, reliable power. You know, in the West we've forgotten that modern medicine can only exist with reliable, affordable fossil fuels. That's where we get the power from. And even if you want to talk about, oh no, well in Quebec we run off hydro. How do you think you could build, build the James Bay Dam with lots and lots of fossil fuels and cement? Oh, and that's another thing one of the people in 
Nomi Klein's presentation was critical of the fact that um, that uh, the Egyptian government is creating jobs. I mean, they've got cement plants and they're building things. They're building buildings. Well, you know, if you have millions of unemployed people, why wouldn't you build buildings and give them work? You know, because you don't have to be a skilled worker at a very high level to do much of the work that's required for construction work. And I'm not I'm not putting down construction workers. They work very hard. They do have skills, but what I'm saying is you don't need a university degree to work on a job site. Um, you probably need some training and apprenticeship training, and there are skilled jobs there, but lots of people can be employed uh, with, uh, you know, shovels and just the hard physical labor that's required in building buildings. So when we understand the fact that Egypt has a very large population of unemployed or underemployed people, any kind of jobs is a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. And again, it's climate colonialism to mock that or think that it's uh, that somehow shutting down a cement plant or shutting down building construction would be good for the environment. But no concern whatsoever for what would happen to those people um, who would be jobless. So uh, we know that Greta's book is coming out this week, the climate book, and you'll find on the cover there's this featured little set of stripes and there's a whole marketing campaign going on called Show Your Stripes. So you'll probably see lots of flags and t-shirts and pants. There's a bus in England that's covered with these stripes. But in fact, this is only representative of the last 150 years or so. When you look at the longer term, and this is from Dr. Roy Spencer, these are the kind of stripes you get. So you find out that, wow, look at that, a thousand years ago, looks like it was as warm or warmer than what they're saying it is today. So it looks to me like there's a cooling, warming, cooling, warming, cooling, warming, little cooling here and there, warming, 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 lots of warming, warming, less warming, cooling, cooling, wow, getting really cold, ooh, super cold, very cold, little ice age, ouch, and then suddenly again, we have some warming. Looks like it's cyclical, doesn't it? Looks like it's probably Mother Nature. So have fun at COP27. Don't be a climate colonialist. And enjoy this beautiful place and country that is just so full of human history. It's uh, incredible. And uh, that's it for the presentation. Um, Friends of Science is an independent group of Earth, Atmospheric, and Solar Scientists and Engineers. We're celebrating our 20th year of offering Climate Science Insights. And it's our view that uh, the sun is the main driver of climate change, not carbon dioxide. And of course, that's very interesting that COP27 will be in Egypt because um, I believe a lot of Egyptian history is related to the sun god and to um, the uh, changes in constellations and uh, movement of the earth in conjunction with the stars. So it's interesting that human history uh, might actually confirm our view as well. Anyway, I hope that you have a good time at COP27. Be a good citizen, be a good traveler, be a good tourist, kids, and uh, don't get in trouble there. Um, and I also would like to ask if people like the work we do, if you found this interesting and enlightening, maybe you could provide us with a small donation. This year is our 20th year of operation. We have a nonprofit society. We don't issue uh, charitable receipts. Uh, our organization is run by volunteers and we have a handful of contracted services that support the ongoing work. So if you could offer a $20 donation by e-transfer, if you'd like to become a member, if you want to make a bigger donation, we'd be happy to receive that as well. And if you can't do any of those things, if you like our work, please share it with others. And uh, 
we'd love for you to subscribe to our website and uh, put in a comment. Let us know what you think. And uh, I look forward to reading the comments. I try to read through as many as I can. So uh, for Friends of Science Society, thank you so much for tuning in and have a great fall and, and winter. Winter is coming. Be prepared. <laughs> Actually, we've got, a, we've got a short video that I just did based on Rob Lemire. He's a Belgian engineer based on one of his contributions to our blog. And he provides a bit of insight on what, how to prepare for blackouts. And they're probably going to be hitting mm, most places of the world in terms of the geopolitical conflicts and the energy crisis that we see. So have a look at that video as well. It's going to be posted on our website, on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for Friends of Science Society. I'm Michelle Sterling.